Back on? Okay. So this is another story of stress corrosion cracking. This is from an Army uh, Black Hawk helicopter. This is painted gray. So what type of Hawk helicopter is this? A Seahawk. Seahawk. And they have the Coast Guard has Jayhawks. Uh, the presidential copter is, they don't need to but presidential. And if you go down to Sikorsky where they make these, they actually have a separate engineering room for the presidential helicopters. Now they don't make that many of them, you know, maybe a few a year, but nonetheless, they actually get a little special attention to the presidential helicopters. So anyway, in the early life of the program, um, within the first couple of years, just a few years ago, um, they had a, uh, uh, a Blackhawk go down in Arkansas on night vision goggle training exercises, and six soldiers got killed. Uh, I think the pilots got killed, and one of the, another soldier was in a coma after the accident. And so there was a lawsuit, and it turns out this is a washer, and this is the nut that holds it on. And I'll pass these around in a second. But the number of holes in the washer is different than the number of holes in the uh, nut. And what you want, they don't want to have a keyway, which is going to be a stress concentrator, and this is to hold the tail rotor together. So you have a tapered shaft for the tail rotor, and you basically just squeeze the shaft onto the thing with friction and hold this thing, keep it from rotating, and there'll always be a nut, I mean a screw. So instead of a keyway, you put a screw between the washer and the nut, and that keeps the thing from loosening. Okay. So you don't trust any kind of wire, you know, wire or, uh, or anything or polymer inside to keep the things from loosening. You actually put a positive. You know, it's, it's a pretty sophisticated design. This is a $400 washer. Okay, it's aluminum, um, painted different colors for different services, but it's got a. A little oxide Martin hard coat in here. It's got a little slot in here, which does have a little bit of wear, okay, where it engages the part of the rest of the thing. So anyway, it went down, and the question was why. We had the failed washer. I don't have the failed washer. This is just an exemplar. Um, and it was stress corrosion cracking. You look at the microstructure of the fracture, it's clearly stress corrosion cracking. Well, there shouldn't have been enough stress on this thing to cause it to crack. Uh, this is... I remember 7075 aluminum alloy in the T6 condition. Remember I told you there's a problem. The T6 condition has the maximum strength properties, the peak here. And it turns out Sikorsky divides their, their helicopter fleets up into different classes, different models of helicopters. And so all the Blackhawks are, they got an engineering group over here. And the next helicopter, the MH-53s, you see H-53s, they've got another group over here. And they make, you know, make a whole bunch of different models of helicopters. But each one is, has its own engineering group. Well, one of the other engineering groups had found out they were getting stress corrosion cracking in these washers. And they realized, <coughs> oops, we shouldn't have made it out of um, T-60 treatment. We should have made it out of T-735. Uh, I'm sorry, T651, okay, which has much better, oh no, they should have made it out of T7, they made it out of, supposedly out of T651, um, and the 51 after the 6 is how do you stress your little okay, so um, there actually are some points to the story. Um, so in crashes, there's a lawsuit about the people who died and are in comas and things like that. And uh, Sikorsky invokes the government contractor's defense. Anybody know what the government contractor's defense is? We'll do a Sorry? We'll do a contract. Nope. Uh, the Supreme Court in the early 90s, almost 25 years ago, ruled that you can't sue a manufacturer of military hardware because military hardware is designed to be pushing the limits of technology, and you're going to have failures. It's sort of like the America's Cup. If you don't have failures, you're not doing your job. You're not pushing hard enough into new technology. Plus, you got nav air, or in this case, uh, the Army probably had the lead on the Black Hawk, 
but you've got a whole group of government scientists who are reviewing the design. So Korsky got the project to do the Blackhawk and Steve Hawk and Jay Hawk and everything else. But they had design reviews. And they come in, and the Sikorsky or Boeing or whomever would come in and they would tell what they're doing on the design. You spend several days, you have a bunch of engineers and scientists reviewing a bunch of engineers and scientists, and the government may, is responsible for the design. So you can't sue the manufacturer for a defective design. That's the government contractor's defense. Sikorsky was the government contractor. They just built what the government approved. And the government said, we want the best technology, the most forward-looking advanced technology because our lives are safe. Okay? And so Congress says, okay, they're going to protect the defense contractors from design flaws. Okay? Um, but they don't protect them from manufacturing flaws. Right? Okay? If they don't manufacture it to the spec, they're dead. Okay. Well, Sikorsky basically came in, their attorneys came in with the government's contractor's defense and these, these uh, uh, military widows and stuff were going to get nothing because of the government contractor's defense. Well, it turns out, two weeks before my, my uh, deposition, we, we all agreed it was stress corrosion cracking. We all agreed it was the wrong heat treatment. And in fact, Sikorsky had discovered because the Navy, the corrosion leader in the services, had found these things in their plastic bag, bag never used, sitting on the shelf, okay, with cracks in them. They'd never been put in service. And they had little cracks. Now this is one, a Navy one that we got, that we saw cut to measure the residual stresses. And we, by measuring the flats, the distance between the flats before the saw cut and after, we could calculate that this thing had about 10 KSI residual stress because it springs open or it springs closed. Turns out this is even more complex because this tensile stress is on one side and it's compressive on the other. But, anyway, uh, but so the, anyway, we, we got an idea of what the stresses were. And it turns out the T6 heat treatment, I think this is 775, um, or no, I think it's 6061. Whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's a heat treatable aluminum alloy. And it had residual stresses, and the stress corrosion cracking susceptibility was 7 KSI. And we had 10 KSI. That's why it's cracking on the shelf. You guys are out in this humid, moist, salt laden atmosphere, and even though it's in a plastic bag, you know, there's a little moisture and humidity that's inside that bag, and it cracks. Because it's got, you know, I can draw my three circles. I think you guys understand the three circles now, okay? Uh, you had the stress from residual stresses. You had a susceptible microstructure. It was the T6 heat treatment. It supposedly had been stress relieved. Um, and it turns out then they, uh, but it hadn't been stress relieved because we measured it wasn't stress relieved. But I didn't know why until I got the drawings, which are essentially the government certified drawings. The government bought off on these drawings. And it turns out the T653, T651, Heat treatment. The five one means you're going to take the bar that this is made out of. You're going to slice it up, but you're going to take the bar and you're going to do a mechanical stretch of one percent strain, which is to the plastic region, and that will relieve the residual stresses in the part. And the five just means it's mechanically stress relief. Okay, one percent. There's a five three heat treatment where you stretch at three percent. Okay, so this is a one percent. And it turns out, what they had done is they bought, they bought a, a bar of material, they sliced it up into little pancakes, and they did all their anodizing and drilling holes and machining. And when they were all done, um, they had bought the, the material as T651, so they figured it had been stress relieved. But after they did all this, they reheat treated it, but they did stress relieve it. <coughs> How do you pull? on this thing in tension with the T651 heat treatment. You can't grab this and pull the tension. What they should have had on the drawing was T63. The three is a compression heat treatment. I can take a disc like this and I can squeeze it by 1% or 3% and I can stress relieve it in compression. 
That's not what the drawing said. And Sikorsky's chief of rotors testified the day after me. He says, oh, we bought it in the stress relief condition. That's sort of like the guy who did the preheat the, the weekend before, right? Yeah. On the welding that I told you about, okay? Oh yeah, we stress, it was stress relief once. It's sort of like the New England Aquarium has stainless steel on the outside structure. It's supposed to look like fish scales, big sheets of stainless steel. And they bought it in the passivated condition, which grows an oxide skin and keeps it from uh, corroding and salt air. That's right on Boston Harbor. And then they go along and they do mechanical abrasion to make, give it some texture. Well, they bought it in the passivated condition and then they scratch off the passivation. Hmm. Okay? So guess what? It's not passivated anymore. So I mean, there's three examples of things I've, I've done where someone, oh, we bought it in that condition and then we transform it so it's no longer in that condition. But we bought it in the right condition for certain corrosion resistance. Well, it turns out Sikorsky realized they had this problem before the accident. Uh, in this other group, and the other group kind of has a communication that said, hey, you got to change out all your uh, T6 washers in the whole fleet, the 1,300 Blackhawks out there, and they put them on order. It's going to take 15 months to get them, uh, $400 a piece. They were on order. The accident occurs nine months later. Well, everything's in process to be changed out. Of course, this included the presidential helicopter too, folks. So the presidential helicopter had lost its tail rotor authority, crashed. There would have been a bigger inquiry. Okay. But anyway, so but we didn't tell the president. Uh, it is, this helicopter didn't crash. And it just, you know, it's another business story of, you know, they actually knew what they had and, and stuff. Uh, anyway, the chief of rotors testified. Nonetheless, two weeks later, of course, he paid $10 million. So, okay. So the widow's got something, yes. What's the amount of force that would give you that compression? No, you just have to, that's 60, 61, so it's about 40 KSI yield, measure the cross-sectional area. You probably have to squeeze it with 30 tons of force or so. But the Navy couldn't just like send it and drag the tank over. Well, the Army could, you don't have a lot of tanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, yeah. Well, you could, but you like to control it a little better than that. <laughs> yeah, put it okay? You like to control it a little bit better. And in fact, this leads into, I showed you this thing before, which shows the types of heat-treated aluminum alloys, and they can be as fabricated in needle cold work, or in the heat-treated alloys, solution heat-treated, or heat-treated T1 through T10. And then you can have other numbers after this. We're not going to go through that. There are a whole book of aluminum alloys and their tempered designations. Okay, so if you want to read the book, go ahead. It's really exciting reading. Okay. Um, so you can stress or leave by stretching or compressing. And here's actually T, T52. Maybe I had it wrong. Well, what they went to eventually uh, was... These went to T752, okay? But the drawings, I suspect the drawings were T751. T752 is compressing the thing, okay? And I, I think I mentioned, I did mention to you guys the fact that if you go to the Davenport, Iowa plant, um, where they make the, the four to six inch thick plates that, uh, and it turns out the alloy that, that Alcoa makes in Davenport, Iowa now for wings and stuff is 7050, it's 7000 series alloy. More modern, more corrosion resistant than uh, uh, 7075. Higher strength too, a little bit higher strength. But if you go to the thicknesses, you can buy this in T7651 or T651 and you're going to find that um, the T7 is the overaging heat treatment. You lose a little bit, should be losing a little bit of yield strength. No, you're not. What's going on here? Oh, so, oh the 7050 is 7075, different alloy. <coughs> so the old alloy, they did over temper, and it was susceptible to stress corrosion crack. Nowadays, they've developed a more stress corrosion cracking resistant alloy, and it has a little bit higher strength, too, because they've optimized some of the alloy elements. So it is, this one they actually get better strength, better corrosion resistance, 
better elongation, okay, the yield strength goes from 61 up to 66. Whether you're talking up to one inch thick or up to three inches thick, if you keep going on this thing, um, this is T7451, T, this is 70 and 7075, 7351, and this would be the three to four inch thick plate. They can make this in up to five or six inch thick plate for bigger wings for bigger aircraft. Okay. So you, and this wing, you're going to machine away 90% of the weight out of this plate. Okay? I mean, aircraft are weight critical. So you start with a thick plate, and you're going to machine away 90% of the weight. Okay? The Air Force causes the buy to fly weight. Everybody in the industry calls it. The Air Force is the big purchaser of aircraft components. You talk about the pounds of metal purchased as a plate or a big forging that you're going to machine down to a, a rotor disc or you're going to machine into a wing and you could be paying five or ten bucks a pound for this aluminum plate and you're going to weigh, you're going to machine away 90 percent of it So now what's your material cost on your flyweight? If you pay $10 a pound and you're machining away 90% of it, you're paying $100 a pound for the material you're flying, okay? And if you're talking nickel-based super alloys, you could be paying $100 a pound, and you multiply that by 10, and your engine cost material can be $1,000 a pound of actual engine weight. Wow. And the Air Force used to have 30 to 1 buy to fly ratios. Most of them are down below 10 now because in the 1980s they had a huge program called near net shape manufacturing. So rather than just making a big round cylinder forging and making a disc out of it, machining away 90% of the weight, 97% of the weight, they now can forge something so closer to the original, the final shape. They spent billions on net shape manufacturing to save many billions. Yes. I was just going to say, I hope that there's some, they collect it and sell it to someone else, the, the, the chips. Yeah. They go back to the, uh, to the refinery because this is, this is, in many cases, triple, the, the nickel-based alloys are triple vacuum melted. Vacuum arc remelted, or triple, double vacuum melted, sometimes triple vacuum melted, and vacuum, and vacuum induction melted, okay? So you're getting rid of all the nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, down to very low values. How do we make landing gear at 250 KSI steel strength and not get hydrogen cracked? Well, because we vacuum melt it three times. There's not a lot of hydrogen left in there. It's below, it's below a half a part per million hydrogen. But if you try to do it in the air, which is where we melt most of the steel in the world, just the moisture in the air. And when you're welding, did you know you're never supposed to weld in a shipyard according to the Navy spec if you're above 80% humidity? Okay, you were in Newport News. How many days did you shut down operations of welding because you were over 80% humidity? So that proves that they never get above 80% humidity in yeah. Newport News, right? Right. Special uh, environmental control inside the ship. I will say that like on the, they have those huge bay doors open, you know, and uh, in the wintertime, of course, all closed because it's freezing cold outside. And then in the, in the spring, it's really nice, and it's like a you know, nice, comfortable 78 degrees, and like breezy, and feels great. And they have all the doors closed. And it's like, well, why wouldn't they open this? You know, like, well, you know, they have a lot of big breeze coming through, blowing all the, like, the gases off the wells that are supposed to like, keep it, you know, contaminants out of the wells when they go. So they don't, they, don't want the, they don't want the kind of atmospheric interference happening while they're doing all the welding, so they keep all the doors closed anyway. So. Well, you can actually see the fog in the summer over the ocean, okay? I mean, the ocean is cooler than the, the air, and so the sun comes down and you start seeing a fog. You want to you want to blow that 100% humidity inside the hangar? Okay? But there's a reason for it. And in fact, they've set up procedures and things to allow for it, but if you, I haven't seen the Navy spec for 30 years, 
but I remember the spec said, no, do not weld with more than 80% humidity. And of course, aboard ship, you know, if you're down in the tropics, it's never above 80% humidity on the ship. Sure, it's even worse than Pasigula. Apparently, it's just an armpit down there. So, do you know how much moisture content is in the air at 100% humidity at, say, 90 degrees Fahrenheit? You know, you, you learn in high school that air is 78% nitrogen, 1% argon, and 21% oxygen, right? That was dry air. That was 0% humidity air. Okay. At about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, you can look it up in the humidity tables and the steam tables, and you'll find that about 5% of your air is moisture. Where do you think rain comes from? Okay. You know, you, you hear about the rainfall in Texas and how they're having floods from the rain in Texas. One time I thought, well, how much fresh water is up there? And you start doing the calculation for even if it's only 1% moisture in the air, which would be 100% humidity, that's when cloud, clouds form, is when you get close to 100% humidity. And they have clouds up there. I've seen them. I don't even have to go up there and measure it, okay? But figure out what the temperature is, figure out what the humidity is, and assume that you've got two miles of thickness of air with whatever the density is, this 1% moisture. And you find there's enough moisture, because you see this, this cloud system go across the United States, and it wets the whole country for 3,000 miles. That's because there's probably 10 or 12 feet. They can wet the whole country for 10 or 12 feet with all the moisture that's up there. There's a tremendous amount of fresh water up there in the atmosphere, okay? And when we get big, heavy rainstorms of an inch, it's just a small fraction of what's up there, okay? Just do the calculation, guys. Don't be afraid to do the calculations, okay? Sometimes you're surprised by the answers. I was surprised at how much moisture is up there. In any case, these things have five to six inches thick. They have different properties in different directions for the rolling direction, okay? This is actually fracture toughness in different directions and you have different fracture toughness. The thicker, the less mechanical work or finer grain size you get, the lower the properties, okay? But the tape, you know, you're not gonna start building aircraft out of this thing unless, um, Boeing's not gonna buy it and put it into a wing unless Alcoa has done, Alcoa and Boeing together usually, have done millions of dollars worth of property evaluation. And it's not just strength. If you were back 100 years ago, it was just yield strength, tensile strength, and elongation. But certainly since the 1950s, fracture toughness, which gets into fracture mechanics, gets into fatigue, gets into critical brittle fracture, and all these other things. I mean, it's, you have to know all the properties. When I said it cost $50 million in 1960s money to develop HY80 and HY100, yeah. They were doing full full trials, but you could have a whole 200-ton heap made by U.S. Steel for less than probably half a million dollars back then. Today, if you wanted to develop a new steel, it would probably be in the several hundreds of millions to get the qualification test. Okay? And this is another problem with our pressure vessels. You guys still use ASME pressure vessel steels. Most of those Almost all of them were developed in the 1940s. And it would cost probably half a billion or a billion dollars to qualify new steels for pressure vessels. The Department of Energy's tried to qualify 9% nickel steels or 9% uh, nickel one molly to use higher temperatures for some of the nuclear reactors and things. They've been doing this for 40 years. And people are still somewhat hesitant because there's not a big enough database out there until you actually build, start building prototypes. Okay, and get experience. And that's why the Navy would, before they started, went to an all HY100 hull, they built a couple of full size 30 foot diameter sections for a couple of boomers uh, back in the 90s uh, and put them in. Even though they only needed HY80, they wanted to get the experience with welding it. And even when they did go to a full size ship, the Seawolf in the early 90s, they still had major problems, even though they had tried to build their way up. Okay. And one of the reasons for building things like the, uh, the Alvin or the Sea Cliff or things like that, that was partly a prototyping research exercise to build small submersibles 
okay? Deep, deep um, submergence things, it, but it also gave them experience with fabricating what they hoped would be the next uh, next alloys for, for full-size uh, subs. Okay, um, so there's lots of different things when you get to the heat-treated alloys. They put silicon in, uh, 4043 is high silicon well filler, filler wire. You've got copper, that's the original Wright Brothers aluminum copper alloys. Uh, not that the Wright Brothers developed it, but back 100 years ago, we, we learned about putting copper with, with uh, aluminum. That copper or that magnesium, which is a couple others over, are serious problems for corrosion pitting because the precipitation hardening, you've got little specks of copper alloy. Copper is more noble than, than aluminum, so now I have little cathodes surrounding my anode. And corrosion occurs in the anode, okay? So I will actually have little galvanic cells just eat away at that. And I mentioned to someone after class yesterday that I think I mentioned in class that the magnesium anodes look like they have in your hot water tank at home, okay? They basically extrude magnesium over a steel wire and bring the steel wire out and this becomes your anode to corrode. It's a sacrificial anode. Well, this magnesium has to be extremely pure, less than seven parts per million nickel. And the reason is nickel and magnesium do not mix in the appreciable proportions. The solubility of nickel in magnesium is only about seven parts per million. If you have more nickel than that, you'll get little, nearly pure nickel precipitates in here, and then your magnesium anode will just consume itself by galvanic action. You'll have little corrosion cells from here to here, and here to here, and here to here, and you take it out of the thing a year later, and it's, it's completely gone, hit it, and it didn't do anything to protect your vessel, your steel vessel. It just protected itself in some areas where it had the nickel, and it corroded itself where you didn't have the nickel, which is everywhere else. So you end up with something that looks like Swiss cheese. So uh, some of these things get to be fairly uh, fairly tight on the composition control if you really want to control for corrosion. Um, so we got magnesium. I think I told you that uh, the largest application of magnesium in the world is alloying with aluminum. Okay. Well, you've got 5% of magnesium in some of these 5,000 series uh, alloys, and even the 7,000, you've got several percent of magnesium. Uh, <coughs> chromium is put in there as a grain refiner. Titanium is as a grain refiner. Um, you don't have nickel in these things. Zinc in the 7,000 series, you actually form magnesium zinc precipitates. You start getting fancy in your precipitates, and the silicon can be in the precipitates and stuff. So, um, a lot of the technology goes into this stuff. Nowhere near the technology that we have in in, uh, uh, in steel because of the different volumes that are used. Now this is shows you aluminum silicon, aluminum copper, aluminum magnesium, and aluminum magnesium silicon. So this is basically 4,000 series, 2,000 series, 6,000 series, and 7,000 series. This is the composition of the weld, and you have regions here. This is looking at the relative crack sensitivity. Remember I showed you a phase diagram. Most of the, all of these particular alloying elements in aluminum have a phase diagram that looks like that. Whether you're talking about copper, or magnesium, or silicon, okay, or zinc, they all have something that looks like this, where this is 100% aluminum, and this is temperature going up. As you add the alloying element, you go from 660 to the melting point of aluminum. Virtually everything you put in there lowers the melting point of the aluminum. Well, that's not a problem. This is about 550, 560, depending on uh, as far as on the line. But what you don't want for welding is to be in this range where you have wide freezing ranges from the beginning of solidification to the end of solidification. This is liquid. This is liquid plus solid. This is solid. You want a relatively narrow solidification range, okay? And then, but basically, what they're plotting here is crack sensitivity, which is equal to solidification range. The very bottom is solid too, right? <laughs> yeah, the very bottom is a mixture of, kind of solid. solid aluminum with a little bit of alloy 
element plus these little precipitates. But these little precipitates cause pitting when you put them in a corrosive environment like seawater. They would cause pitting if you put them in um, something like Deer Island sewage treatment plant. Okay, but that's why we do clad aluminum with 100% aluminum on the surface. Most of your cookware is nearly pure aluminum or 3000 series, which is nearly pure aluminum and doesn't have these little precipitates for strength. Who needs a pot that has 60,000 pounds per square inch strength? Okay. Okay, so basically there's certain ranges where you have huge amounts of crack sensitivity and it's basically all the door is showing you by another way. You avoid certain composition ranges. You don't want to be between one half a percent and four percent magnesium in your weld metal. So you either highly alloy your weld metal or you don't alloy at all. So it turns out if you start looking at um, yes. If you're not welding, this isn't a problem, though, right? If you're not welding, it's not a problem, but there's not much the Navy doesn't weld. You don't like the ribbon structures. Okay. Although, as you get into composites and other things, um, it turns out the, the two chief weld metals for aluminum are 1100, which is pure aluminum. So you be basically, if you weld with pure aluminum weld metal, you're going to be trying to work on this side and very lightly alloy. The problem is the weld metal is not going to have great strength. You go with the 4000 series, so the aluminum silicon 4043, and you're trying to work over on this side. So you're putting enough silicon in there to have a short freezing range because the weld metal has got so much silicon in it. So those are not the only weld metals that should have a thing in here sometime. Somewhere showing you the welding of aluminum. There's lots of choices of filler metals, and you choose it for different reasons. And there are cracking tests for aluminum, just like there are for steel. This is just making a circular patch, just counting how, you know, how much crack you got as you go around. Okay, just make a little circular pat patch on a beat. Aluminum cracks worse than steel. Okay, this is another crack. This is a center centerline crack. This is a toe crack, going all the way around. Okay, you pick the wrong patches. So here's 6061 made with 1100 and here's 2219 welded to 1100 with 1100 filler wire. So if you don't pick the right combinations of filler wire. So it's actually harder when someone says, comes to me, if they come to me and say I want to repair something of steel, I say okay, what's the hardness? What's the chemical composition? From that I can go to Stout and Doty or American Welding Society, Welding Handbook, and I can write up a welding procedure with those two pieces of information. Okay? Tells me I'd be able to calculate the preheat, figure out what welding wire they want to use, um, and we can have a procedure. Aluminum, I need to know the chemical composition, the full chemical composition of each alloy. If you're welding two things together, they don't have to be the same alloy. Okay? You start welding dissimilar aluminum alloys, it gets even tougher to pick the right filler metal. Okay? And the, the welding process has different amounts of dilution, so you have to worry about those things. But there are welding books on aluminum, and you can look these things up. Okay, any questions? So this is, this is, I'm sure this is why I put this in my notes at some time in the past. This is a comparison of the distribution of yield strength in a 7075 T6 outflat aluminum sheet. So out of how many specimens? Uh, uh, 4,290 mil tests, okay? 40% of them had a very narrow distribution of yield strengths. But then, oh, this is actually, this is all 4,000. But 180 specimens from a single sheet had a narrower distribution. But whether it's steel or aluminum or any other metal, you're going to have a range of properties. And we usually design for um, specified minimum yield strength, SMYS. Okay? So the designers are going to specify, they're going to design assuming they got the worst worst piece of material there, okay? 
And that's sort of what happened with the Seawolf. I told you the Seawolf, they thought they were welding HY100, they thought they had a filler wire that would be an HY100 filler wire, but because of the range of variability, they actually got something more like an HY130 filler wire. They needed tighter hydrogen control. They didn't have that, and they welded up 18% of the ship with a filler wire that uh, was a little too rich in composition. Uh, let's talk a little bit about aluminum. Um, one of the problems with heat treated aluminum, I told you yesterday, non heat treated aluminum, like the 5000 series, uh, we just use alloying elements to strengthen it. Maybe we're only going to get 20 or 25 ksi, which is less than the strength of steel, but it's a lot lighter. So the overall strength to weight ratio is better for aluminum. You can make lightweight ships out of um, non heat treated aluminum alloys. Well, um, if you go to heat treated alloys, because you have to go through this precipitation, you know, the solutionizing and precipitation and heat treatment and temper tempering, just like you get the highest strength steels, you can't match that in the weld metal with aluminum alloys. You can with steels. We can weld HY80 or HY100, which has been heat treated, and we actually have weld metals that can give us match the strength, even though they're a cast structure. I don't want to get into all the metallurgy of why, but we can match the strength in steel weld metal all the way up to a couple hundred KSI, okay? Aluminum, you can't do that. It doesn't have the same properties of transform transforming crystal structure from FCCC to BCC and stuff. Aluminum only has one crystal structure, FCC, through all the temperature range. So it turns out if you're gonna weld heat treated aluminum alloy, you're gonna have to play some games about getting more weld metal in that groove than you can fit in the groove, okay? So what you do is you put dumper plates on and then do fillet welds around them. So now I got more weld metal, and if I pull this in tension, I'll get 100% strength across the joint. Did you weld the joint? Did you weld the joint before you put the filler plates on the top and the bottom? No, no, well, you may have, yes, it you may have, but usually there, but not, okay. usually not, okay? Because you're getting, you got plenty of strength from the, the plates on the top. You don't bother, you, you just fit them together, no, throw the tape, plates on it and weld those. Because if you make if you make the plate large enough, you don't want that extra step of welding both. Okay, sure. More expensive. You can do it like this where you have skip welds and only one plate. It's not, you can overlap, a lap weld often is all you really need. But all these things add weight. But that's what you pay for in aluminum. Okay? If you want high strength in aluminum, you're gonna have to add weight. Well, the reason you use aluminum in the first place is a lightweight, right? So. Right, but you get more back, more lightweighting, even though you're adding weight to the joint. I mean, you got some wiggle room, right? I mean, more or less the amount of weight savings that you have is so much more than the extra well, amount you have to add, add right, at, right. The, at the joints here and there. Exactly, it's a trade-off. Yeah. But if you're in the non-heat treatable alloys, which is what you guys are building your LCS and things like that out of, or superstructures and things, there's not this trade-off. This is in the heat treatable alloys. I've gone to heat treatable to save even more weight. I can use half the thickness with double the strength, but I gotta pay back about, I gotta pay a tax on it, which means I got some joints that are a little, a little clumsy, okay, in, in terms of geometry. They're not nice, smooth, clean lines. The other problem is you don't wanna put your weld metal at the corners. You know, Reggie Palou, who used to teach fracture around here, used to say something won't fail unless it's been welded. In 1992, I gave the Houdremont lecture of the International Institute of Welding up in Montreal. And this was the keynote talk for this International Welding Conference held every couple of years. And I got up and I said, I put up Reggie's quote you know, uh, on a view graph. It said, something won't fail unless it's been welded. Yeah. Dead silence from 500 of the world's <laughs> top welding engineers. And then there's slowly a little laughter in the middle through the room as they started thinking about it. But that's the attitude. And in fact, I teach when you take my solid state and I give you an introduction to welding in the solid state thing. That first time I say, hey, for one of the rule, chief rules of welding is eliminate all joints possible because it will fail at the joints. But there's a reason. We put the joints at the most highly stressed locations. Of course it's going to fail there. And there been many times I get some clown, I mean some expert on the other side who said, oh, it's obviously defective it failed at the joint. 
No, it failed at the corner. The weld just happened to be there. Okay? It's not a cause and effect. The weld metal actually was in steels in most cases, just as good. But you located it at the stress concentration point, the corner. So in aluminum, you do all kinds of things that you don't do in, don't need to do in steel. And you you bend the, the aluminum because it's relatively easy to bend. And then you put your welds at other locations. There's no there's no welds in these corners here. You just you end up doing twice as much welding, but you don't run into fatigue problems and other things because the, the aluminum's at the corner. Here are some other designs, okay? You machine the surfaces sometimes. This is getting expensive, okay? But now you can put a weld in, get good backing. Um, uh, the guys who are designing aluminum structures have a different mindset than the guys welding steel. Like the guys welding steel, you just took, take two plates and you stick them together at some angle, and you've thrown a weld. The guys in aluminum know it's not that simple. The metallurgy is different, and you're willing to pay a little more for joint prep to make sure you get the properties across the joint that you want. In steel, steel is actually very forgiving in welding. Believe it or not, we have lots of problems with it. That's good for me, okay? But, um, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, it is fairly forgiving. Um, I mean, I can show you a bunch of examples. Here's some things with pipe welds, okay? Um, so ordinarily in steel, you just put a weld, right? You know, pipe, you know, you know how you weld steel or nickel base alloys, but in aluminum, you might actually weld it and then grind it flush and then put a sleeve over it. Okay, the sleeve could be a split sleeve, two halves, you know, clamshell, and then you fill it weld around that, and now you're going to get a full strength weld. Okay, that's full strength. You could do a bell and spigot joint. This is done on a lot of steel pipelines for water pipe and things like that. Easy to assemble. Fillet welds don't have to have as much welder skill, but it's also the type of thing we do in aluminum quite often. Um, here's oh here's a very common one. When you have tubular structures, you put in a gusset plate, and you weld your tube, your heat treated aluminum tube, and you put long welds in the gusset plate rather than a circumferential weld, which is limited in length. Okay, those. Those linear gusset plate welds, you make the gusset plate big enough, and you know, if you have enough room, you can have plenty of weld metal. Even if it's half the strength, it's going to give you the full strength of the joint. Okay? What you want is the failure to be in the base material. And in fact, that's often what I look at when I see a failure. Did it fail in the base metal or did it fail in the weld metal? Okay? Uh, if it fails in the weld metal, I I have to start asking myself, why did it fail in the weld metal? I got a problem right now, I haven't even seen it. I've seen one picture of it. They were stacking pipe for a new pipeline out in Arizona. And this stacker, which is just like a great big forklift that can carry about you know, five or six uh, lengths of uh, 40, foot, 40 foot long pipe that you know, weighs tons, it's just a huge forklift. Well, it broke. They, they built a special bracket, and it was just a carbon steel weld. But I looked, and there's no deformation in the, 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 the I-beams that they made this thing out of. They didn't bend before the weld broke. I mean, all I had was a picture from kind of like here to the back of the room of the failure of these things that are this size. And I called up the, uh, the insurance adjuster and said, defective welds. I said, how can you tell? I said, because the, the metal didn't bend before the weld broke. And I got a book by Lincoln Electric that's been around for 50 years that says for mild steel, a properly made fillet weld will outpull the metal for any direction or magnitude of load. For mild steel, not HY80. But most of the steel we weld is mild steel. And I've been on this a number of times. In fact, I went to the Supreme Court of Massachusetts 35 years ago where I got in and testified that this guy was jacking up his, his truck to do some work, and he was using the ICC bumper, which is this little I beam thing at the bottom, so when a car runs into it, it doesn't undermine, chop everybody's head off. And uh, uh, so the ICC bumper had failed. He was jacking by the ICC bumper, and it just lifted straight up. No bending of that little, you know, three-sided frame 
uh, steel, but the wells broke. And all we had was a lousy little Polar Polaroid photo from years before, no other evidence. And I told the jury that was defective welding. And the other side took it to the Supreme Court and said, he couldn't say that. Yeah. But I had the reference from the Lincoln Manual, okay, it says, any a properly made weld in steel, mild steel, will out outpull the base metal for any direction and size of the load. In a weld. Okay? The Supreme Court has held it. It's actually a famous case in Massachusetts now. On how much an expert can say when they know nothing. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I did know something. They just didn't like what I know. The other side didn't like it. This is actually a master chart just to show you the one last thing here. Um, um, selection of alloys. You have one base plate composition here, one base plate composition here, and this tells you in the middle. If you go down this column, this column, find an intersection, it will tell you what filler metal to use. Okay? To balance your composition of things. Uh, so that's something you have to worry about more. Uh, so tomorrow we'll finish up a little bit on aluminum. We'll go to uh, titanium. I'll give you my quick song and dance on corrosion. Everything you need to know about corrosion in 10 minutes. Although, you know, we really have been talking about corrosion as we've been going along, although it's not in an organized way. And we haven't just been talking about welding metallurgy. I mean, I've stopped at times to tell you a little bit of metallurgy. But all you've gotten here is this is a typical Navy survey course. So <laughs> don't think you know enough to go out and solve the problem. Hopefully you know enough to know when to call in the right expert. Yes. Uh, and there are plenty of experts at NAFC. Okay. I mean, that, David Taylor, you've got a whole crew of about 15 welding experts. You've got about 20 corrosion experts. And yeah, it might cost some money, but if you've got a big problem, okay. However, sometimes you need the chief engineer to tell NAFC that this is what they're being paid for. For example, remember the fire up here at Portsmouth, where the guy set the fire and wanted to go home early. Mm -hmm. uh, so I get a call from a former student from this class that says, uh, Professor Eager, we had a we had a fire inside the sub. Now this was before it did all the news. Okay, he says we need someone to come help us figure out if the steel's been damaged. I said, Well, I got some engineers we can do it. And he goes, oh, this is a pretty good sized problem. I didn't know it was a four hundred million dollar problem at the time. But what he told me is he couldn't get anyone at David Taylor to pay attention to it. Okay. He was in charge of the repairs there. I think he was the commander at the time. The guys at David Taylor, they're not going to pay attention unless you give them a contract. Okay? they got to charge the time to something. So they're not exactly someone you can call up and say, hey, tell me. Because, no, let's get off. Let's get off. <laughs> <laughs> um, 